Welcome back to our journey to Quant 5 on quantguild.com. Today we're going to be answering some finance questions. Don't know where to start on your journey to becoming a quant? Check out quantguild.com. We'll help you master the necessary quantitative skills. In our last episode, we got to rank 51 in math. In the previous one, we got to rank 53 in probability. Today we're going to be hopping in to some finance questions. Let's go ahead and get started. In a Monte Carlo simulation, an, an analyst simulates asset returns that are normally distributed with a mean of 7% and a standard deviation of 2%. What is the probability that a randomly chosen simulated return is less than 5%? Great question on Monte Carlo simulation. Let's head on over to the iPad and discuss the solution. I quite like this question because it's combining ideas from probability and statistics into the finance domain, which is exactly what we're going to see in higher level questions. Anyway, we're going to require more tools in our math and statistics and probability toolbox to be able to solve such finance questions. But this is a great way to get started. Monte Carlo simulation is an idea from probability and statistics. And in this context, we have some sort of return and we're generating draws from this distribution or several other distributions to try to analyze maybe our portfolio returns maybe the expected return, maybe the variance or the probability of different outcomes. In this case, we're trying to figure out what the probability that a randomly selected return is going to be less than 5%. So how do we go about solving this? Well, we're going to start by saying R. So we're going to say let R denote returns. And R is a random variable that follows a normal distribution with a mean of 7% and a variance of 2% squared. So the problem gives us that the standard deviation is 2%, and this would imply that the variance is going to be 2% squared. Okay, well, if this is the case, how do we find a probability? Well, we know a normal distribution is fully characterized by its probability density function or cumulative distribution function. So what is its probability density function? Well, this is going to be equal to one over the square root of two pi sigma squared e to the negative x minus mu squared divided by two sigma. And this is going to be for x between negative infinity and positive infinity. That is the support. If you integrate over this entire region, you will in fact get one, making it a valid probability density function. Moreover, mu and sigma squared are constants. They are constants. If you're doing something like a maximum likelihood estimation, then yeah, you could treat them as, as parameters and optimize over them, sure. But in this context, they are constants because we are given a 7% average return and a 2% standard deviation or a 2% squared variance. So in this case, this is the distribution that fully specifies our stock returns. So it fully characterizes the randomness. of R, our stock returns. So how do we find this probability? Remember, we're being asked that the probability, or what is the probability that R is less than 5%? Well, the cumulative distribution function is capital F of X, and this is equivalent to the integral from negative infinity to X of and the integrand here is going to be the probability density function. And I'm using a variable substitution here since our upper limit is using that variable x. So we're integrating from the lowest part of the support, that negative infinity, all the way up to x. And whenever you do this with a probability density function, you are actually finding the probability that the random variable, let's just call it in this case capital R, is less than some little x, is less than some little x. So in this case, I'm saying that we have a probability density function that governs or specifies 
the randomness of random variable r, in this case r returns, then the associated cumulative distribution function is equal to the integral from the lowest part of the support all the way to the value we specify, in this case x, and that is going to be equal to the probability that that random variable is in fact less than that, that value little x. Now that value little x. So why is this useful? Well, we know what f of s is, should say little f of s, and we know what x is. So in the context of our problem, right, this is our f of r. This is our f of r. This fully characterizes the randomness of our returns. And now we know what x is. x is 5%. So essentially we're just we're just using these equations all together and we're going to be able to actually find the value of this probability because remember mu and sigma in this probability density function are already defined. They're given to us by the problem. 7% and 2%. should say 2% squared. So plugging everything in, we can say that the probability that r is less than 5% is equal to the integral from negative infinity to 5% of 1 divided by the square root of 2 pi sigma squared out of the square root is just going to be sigma, that's 2%, e to the negative, and this has to be, or we can use whatever variable we like here actually because we're using a constant 5% here. So we can say x minus 7% squared divided by 2 times sigma, which is 2%, and this will be dx. So this is going to be the probability that the return is less than 5%. And if you plug this into any sort of cumulative distribution function calculator, you can approximate this integral numerically, you are going to end up with 15.87%. 15.87%. Let's head on back over to Quantico to see if that is an answer choice. All right, so we are given 15.87% here. We will submit, we get the correct answer and we are ready to move on to the next question. Using matrix multiplication, calculate the expected return of a portfolio with weights 0 0.25, 0 0.35, 0 0.40, and expected returns 7%, 9%, and 11%. This is a fantastic question. Starting to bring in some ideas from linear algebra. Let's head on over to the iPad and discuss this one together. I can't emphasize enough how important linear algebra is in quantitative finance. So it's nice to see a level one question incorporating some of it. It's useful not only for computing things like statistics associated with a panel of stock data, but it's also useful for things like finding stability and structure in data for trading strategies. It is a very, very important subject to study thoroughly as it is one of the most important tools in your toolbox when you start confronting real world problems. So it's nice to see it in the level one question. Let's talk about it here. So we're given a set of vectors. The first vector is going to be the weight of a stock in your portfolio. So in other words, this is a stock weight, this is a stock weight, this is a stock weight, and this is the corresponding expected returns. So in this capacity. Okay, knowing this, how can we compute the expected return of our portfolio? Well, it's quite easy to compute the expected return of our portfolio in general. So if I say pi is our portfolio, our portfolio return, and we want to find the expected portfolio return, then we can just say that this is equal to, and we can just weight the expected returns by the portfolio weight and end up with the overall expected portfolio return. So in other words, stock one has an expected 7% return with a weight of 25%. So we will just take the product of those two right there. And then this is just gonna end up being the sum product of all of the weights and expected returns. OK, 
okay? So that's how we can compute the expected return of our portfolio, but we wanna use matrix multiplication. Matrix multiplication is a super important idea because we are going to be able to do this not just for a set of expected returns, but we're also gonna be able to do this for a time series. So if I have a large selection of assets in my portfolio, and I have a whole bunch of data across time for all of these assets, so let's say I have 10 years of, of pricing data for all of these assets, then wouldn't it be a pain to continue to do a sum product in this capacity? Wouldn't it be nice if I can just press a magic button and do it automatically? Well, in fact, that's what the matrix multiplication is essentially doing. It's essentially doing this, this large sum product for us. And what it's doing is it's isolating it to each individual time when we do it with say something like a, a time series of a large selection of assets. But you can check out my previous video on portfolio rebalancing if you're interested in that implementation. Here we're just gonna solve the very simple question of finding the expected return of our portfolio using the matrix multiplication. So we are after this. This is in fact what we are after, but we can do it with matrix multiplication. Now, when you multiply matrices together, we need to make sure that the inner dimensions match. So W, the dimensionality of W is going to be three by one. And the dimensionality of R is going to be three by one. So if I tried to compute this product here, and I'm gonna use app for this matrix multiplication, could we do this? Well, this is three by one, and this is three by one. The inner dimensions don't match, so we can't do this matrix product. So I have to transpose something, okay? I have to transpose something. Now, which one do I transpose? Does it actually matter which one I transpose? What is, what is transposing anyway? Well, all transposing is doing is it's going to swap the rows and it's going to swap the rows with the columns. So if I have a three by one, it's gonna become a one by three and vice versa. So what does this actually look like? Well, W is equal to a column vector here. So W transpose is going to be equal to a row vector of 0 0.25, 0 0.35, 0 0.40. And this is going to be one row by three columns. All right, why is this nice? Well, this is nice because now when I do WT multiplied with R, then I have a one by three and a three by one. So this is going to be equal to 0 0.25, 0 0.35, 0 0.45, this vector multiplied with this vector of, I believe this was 7%, 9% and 11%. Now, how do we do matrix multiplication? Well, Remember, we take each element in the row, and then we take the sum product with each element in the, the, co the corresponding column. And we would do this for each row and each column in the set of matrices, but in this case, it's just a set of vectors. So what do we actually end up with when we do this matrix multiplication? Well, this is going to be equal to 0.25 times 0 0.07 plus 0.35 times 0 0.09 plus 0 0.40 times 0 0.11. In other words, it's this times this plus this times this plus this times this. And this is going to be equal to the expected return of our portfolio. So if you knew that you could just weight all of the expected returns by the portfolio weight or the stock weight in your portfolio, that's great. But I would highly recommend that you start to consider representing these structures as vectors and matrices because it will make your life infinitely easier down the road. And it will also set you up for a variety of optimization problems and other very challenging, maybe quant style questions. Not just quant style questions, but problems you'll encounter in your day to day on the job. So what is this actually equal to? If you plug this into a calculator, you should get, I believe it's 9.3% as the expected return. Let's head on back over to Quant Guild, see if that is an answer choice.
Back on Quant Guild here, we see 9.3. I'll submit this answer choice. And we get it correct. Lo and behold, it computes the answer the exact same way that we did it on the iPad. We are taking the transpose of the weight matrix and computing that matrix product. And we get the expected return of 9.3%. Fantastic. Great explanation, great question. Let's see what we got here. What is the future value of an annuity due that pays $200 at the beginning of each year for five years at an interest rate of 6%? It's a great time value of money question, a great, great time value of money question here. And we are talking about a series of cash flows. So let's head on over to the iPad. We're going to talk about this this annuity do. So if you're a bit rusty on the time value of money and the notion of annuities and perpetuities, definitely head on over to the lesson section and check it out. But a very simple idea to understand is that the present value and future value of a corresponding ordinary annuity is typically going to be less than that of an annuity due because interest is accrued for an extra period. So in other words, for an ordinary annuity, the future value is going to be equal to some payment times one plus R to the N minus one divided by R. And for an annuity due, we simply take that. So the future value of the annuity due is going to be equal to going to take that future value, bring it down here and multiply it by just an extra interest accruing period. And that is going to be the difference between ordinary annuity and an annuity due. Um, again, this is really nothing difficult. It's just when the payment is due at the beginning or the start of the period and whether or not there's this extra interest that is, is going to be earned um, by the, the one who is offering the, the loan. Um, again, not difficult, but it's going to be the difference between getting this question right or wrong because if you use the ordinary annuity formula, it's going to be incorrect. So what do we have here? We have that the payment is $200. We have that the rate is, I believe, what is it, 6%? And we have the periods being five. So if we just plug this into our formula, we get that the future value is equal to 200, and this is going to be 200 times one plus six percent raised to the fifth power for five periods minus one divided by that six percent okay and that would mean that the future value of the annuity due is going to be equal to that future value whatever it is times one plus six percent so if you plug this into a calculator, I believe you get something of around 1,195. So let's head on over to Quant Guild and see if that is in fact an answer choice. We see answer choice D, 1,195. Submit, we get it correct. That is in fact exactly how we went about solving it on the iPad. So the explanation matches up with the way that I went about solving it again. Nothing particularly challenging. It's just an ordinary annuity times an additional period. That is going to be the last question for this video. Let's head back over to the dashboard. We have ranked up to 51. These were pretty easy questions. I think they were all of one question. So we have increased our finance rank by one point. And that is going to do it for the finance subject. In this video. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. In the next episode, we are going to go about answering a whole bunch more probability questions. Hopefully, we can continue to rank up and progress on this journey to quant five. Learn a whole bunch about math, probability, and finance. Thanks again so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.